whatever you think. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to class four, the power of brushwork, session one, focusing on sky and trees. And uh, we've spent this uh, little bit of time before we pushed record, um, just discussing that this has been a kind of a different um, presentation of my classes where I'm not uh, doing finished paintings as much or even starting paintings. It's been more about exercises and learning about different ways to think about um, all of the different aspects of clouds and now trees. Um, a number of you asked about the fact that uh, painting greens is difficult. And I made an offhand comment with Cheryl that I don't actually like greens, so it doesn't matter. And, but I love greens. I really, really do. My happy place is always a green place. Um, and so I thought that we could spend part of today learning about many different ways to think about questions we can ask about the greens that we are looking at or want to create. All right, because I think we all know the uh, probably all learned in first, second, maybe kindergarten, yellow and blue make green. green. <laughs> and blue and yellow make green. Green. Well, wellow. <laughs> wellow. Wellow. That was a, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It still makes green. Um, and so, but it's not enough to make green, right? And the reason that I um, do paint with a limited palette to, you know, two of each primary, a split primary palette, and don't have the secondaries is mostly because of green. I found that in my early teaching days, especially when I was teaching plein air classes, that uh, when I had green on the um, menu, <laughs> you know, told them to bring sap green or phthalo green or whatever, they, people would just look out at the scene they were painting and they would label it. They would be like, okay, the sky is blue. I've got blue. This, you know, the sun is yellow. I've got yellow, the whatever, you know, and then they would look uh -huh. out Northwest and they would see green. And so they would just squeeze out whatever green that they brought. And that was their color. And they wouldn't ask deeper, better questions. So, you know, I'd be constantly just walking around as people were painting, saying, yes, you're seeing green, but what type of green, right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually I was just like, you're an idiot, Mike. Take the green away. Make them mix the green, because then they begin to question the green that they're mixing, right? So when we're looking out, you know, wherever you live, especially because we're getting near spring now, or I guess we are officially in spring now. Happy first day of spring or second day of spring. Um, there's a lot of vibrant, vibrant greens. Not the kind of greens you'll typically see in my paintings, the spring greens. Um, just because I think they're pretty short lived, no matter where you live. Um, but they are gorgeous. They do literally just mean life right rebirth the planet is coming back and so there is something wonderful in those greens so we're going to learn about mixing all the way from spring baby gr grass you know that vibrant just lush if you have a dog you know it's out there eating the lawn right now um all the way to the fall colors those are the colors i prefer just again personal i'm not telling anybody what colors are better or worse it's just, I prefer the reds and golds. And that's just kind of the color scheme that I've leaned towards in my career. Um, and I know like Gail and a couple other of you that are uh, kind of interested in the more tonalist work that you'll see more of that. And if you look back throughout history, I'm looking over Donna's shoulder at that beautiful uh, sky or seascape there with the trees, you know, those are green trees, but not nearly green in there, right? Um, and so I want to show you guys how to control it because it is so funny. Like every class I teach when I especially teach in person, every plain air class, the students are always like the hardest color to paint or to make is brown and green. And then at the end of the day, everybody's like, my whole palette is only brown and green. It's, just, <laughs> it's, 
it's where colors just end up. Like when I scrape my palette at the end of the day, I just have piles of greens and browns. Um, you'll notice when you clean your palette for the most part that you won't end up with yellows very often. Yellows are by far and away, you know, when we look at a color wheel, all the colors are kind of represented with equidistant spacing. But the truth is that the yellows are a very, very weak color or they just get the short shift that as soon as any color is added to yellow, the name changes. Mm -hmm. Yellow only takes up this little tiny space, right? <laughs> you get yellow and you get warmer yellow and then all of a sudden it's orange. You get greenish, you get yellow that leans towards green. And as soon as you add a touch of blue, what is it? Blue green. Is yellow. Green. Yeah. Yeah, green, yeah, yellowish green. So it takes up a very little amount of space. So if you're ever curious about that, like why when I clean my palette, do I not have piles of yellow? It's because yellow just mixes so quickly and becomes another color. Whereas the blues can retain their strength, the maroons, the purples, the um, even the blues retain their strength for quite a bit longer. So if we were actually looking at a true color wheel, it'd be very lumpy and uh or it would be you know the yellow would take up a very small portion of it the greens actually take up a pretty large portion of the color wheel because it's pretty easy to mix them and then when you mix across so i'm saying you know we got the vibrant greens on the outside of the color wheel I'm trying to figure out where my hands go because it's in reverse to me <laughs> it's across you know starting to add the reds and the uh, oranges and um, maroons from across the color wheel it still retains its greenness for quite a while. Mm. So, you know, while I think, wow, mixing greens, it's almost hard not to mix greens. Um, the truth is, I think that the important part is learning to mix the right greens, just like weeds, right? We want to put the right thing in the right spot in our garden. Otherwise, it's a weed or an invasive species. But if we want it there, glorious. Um, so how do we mix the right greens? What are the questions we should be asking? And then how do we control that, right? We start mixing the wrong green. How do we bring it back a little bit? Looking at you, Sharon, as you mix your giant piles of color, um, how do we split those up? You know, we <laughs> greens. And all of a sudden you're just realizing, wow, I've, I've just used all my yellow because I've got a great big pile of green Yeah. and I want it to get yellower, but I have to use so much yellow because it's a weak color comparatively. Don't keep mixing into this giant pile. Start separating that pile out because some of those we can just add a little bit of, you know, if we have black on our palette or a little more ultramarine and we can make a dark green, we can make a, you know, a grayed down green, a add a little bit of red and all of a sudden we get this nice brownish green again, like we're looking over Donna's shoulder at those beautiful colors. So when your colors, when you're mixing colors and they're getting out of control, again, I call it the blob that eats everything. Cause it <laughs> happens to me too, where I'm just like, why is that? Why can I not get this green yellower? without adding a whole tube of it, because literally in that pile is a tube or two worth of uh, paint. So just remember that, just keep splitting it off. You can just put it aside. Those colors are very, very useful and we can swing them a lot easier when they're not gigantic piles. Same note, in but in reverse, we wanna mix big enough piles. I do mm -hmm. some of your guys' palettes, then your photos, I do see how uh, scrapey you're getting. Like I can tell you're running out of color. <laughs> <laughs> mix big enough piles, but don't mix such big piles that they're eating all of your other colors. Um, a famous saying amongst uh, painters when we get out there and you'll always hear it if you have a group of painters like, oh man, I mixed the perfect color and I'm, I've ran out halfway across the sky or across this field. Um, the saying is paint like you're rich. I know that sucks and I know paints are expensive, but literally put out enough paints. If you're using oils, you know, you can save them. They'll keep lasting, but it's important that we're mixing enough color. Um, on that very same note, 
That's why we use a split primary palette in the beginning, because we can learn to mix those colors, remix those colors much, much easier. Um, again, I was going into my drawer, I'm jumping all over the place here, but I was going into the drawer where the greens hide <laughs> all the tubes of green that I've been, I've gotten over the years. And I was amazed how many tubes there are. Um, but I still prefer a limited palette, even when I'm painting a green scene, which happens again a lot in the Pacific Northwest, I rarely pull out more than one tube of green at a time. Um, I rarely will have a phthalo green, a sap green, an olive green, and a whatever green out at the same time, um, just because it becomes like a mad scientist, right? When you do have to remix a color or get a color close enough, if you have a huge amount of colors out, especially as we're beginning to paint and learning about how the colors mix, it can really get in your way having a huge amount of colors. So for those of you writing notes, I did not put this on the mixing green handout that I gave you guys. If you are focusing on, and we'll talk about this when I get up to the easel a little bit more and I'll show you some examples. But if you are mixing spring greens and you want that verdant, life-filled, highly energetic, vibrant green, go ahead and pull a phthalo green. It is a dangerous but amazing color. It is so filled with potential, <laughs> so much potential that it can take over my paintings. Um, and to me, it is, or there you go, it's a gorgeous color. And Jane just showed us a tube of it. If you are unopened, <laughs> unopened, yeah, because it could explode. I mean, don't even look at it wrong, it could just explode and contaminate your whole studio. Um, it's so strong. It is one of the strongest colors besides Thalo Blue out there. Um, but if you are going to use a Thalo Green or a Thalo Blue, I suggest having a Cadmium Orange on your palette. Cadmium Orange is another color that I own but never pull out. Um, but it's a perfect complement almost to phthalo green and it can, can they it can control it really well if that makes sense so you want kind of an opposite color on there my favorite cadmium orange i'm sorry cadmium orange yeah well and it could be truly probably any orange but cadmium orange is one of the only single pigment oranges it's very bright it's very strong it's very dense um and it doesn't take a lot to control that um, that uh, phthalo green. Um, I paint with uh, an amazing, well, I used to, she moved, but Jennifer Deal is one of my favorite um, still life oh, paintings. Oh, she's great. So good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you get to see some of our Jennifer Deal paintings here at the house. Um, she's so good. She does use phthalo blue and phthalo green on her palette because I, I consider her a colorist, right? And I was asking her, I'm like, how do you have that? But your parent paintings don't come out looking cartoonish and garish and over the top, like what I feel happens when I add those colors to mine. And she was the one that gave me the suggestion of the um, cadmium orange. So she's like, you just need a counterbalance to that color on your palette. All right. My favorite green that I use the most of any greens, again, I don't use green hardly ever, is um, sap green. Um, mm -hmm. Sap green leans a little bit red. It's not quite as reddish. I don't believe we'll test it here in a little bit as olive green. But sap green has a lot of potential. It can go either direction. You can you know warm it up. You can cool it down really nicely. Again, we'll, we're going to do some experimenting with these colors. I've got a whole palette covered with just color tubes. Um, but that's my favorite. It's a little more neutralized, a little more controllable, and it already leans to the reddish side of green just a touch, which again, where I live with all the pine trees and everything else, a lot of our greens will lean towards the red just a touch. Um, and that will take me to my main point, and you'll see that again when I step up to the eagle, is that with green, the counter to green is red, right? On the color wheel, green is made of yellow and blue, and the opposite color is red. 
Red is the great modifier. That's not a term I made up. It's a term I heard um, from Scott Christensen when I was taking a plein air class with him. And it just changed my world. It changed how I saw green. Um, Say that it, word again. What was the word? What the is red? Modifier. modifier. The great what? Modifier. Uh, modifier. Yeah, and it just allows you to control your greens and take them to what I consider a more realistic thing. Here's another note, and not my question. This was from Amy Erickson, another painter that I just adore and um, love her work. But I was painting in California in Monterey Bay, and she came around and she just kind of very gently whispered in my ear, the world's not as colorful as you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Much grayer. And you know, in Oregon where the ocean is greens and browns and mer Going down there to, you know, Monterey with the turquoises and all the things, I just way played it up, right? I was just over the top with the colors I was painting. And um, so that's something to keep in mind is a lot of times we'll look out, we'll see green, we'll see a vibrant, verdant green. But in truth, it's probably not going to be phalo green, right? It's not going to be, you know, um, manganese blue and... Uh, cadmium yellow light generally the same thing happens with the turquoise colors that we see so just again just thinking like okay i know that it's green but where where does it lean does it lean towards the yellows does it lean towards the reds does it lean towards the blues is it more in the brownish family um that's just gonna really help you to mix your colors because literally as we get deeper in our questions about what we're seeing, the terminology and the verbiage comes up of what do I need to add? Mm -hmm. So we in a rush and we want the perfect color, but the truth is that the power comes in the questions. Um, I was talking to the small group that showed up really early uh, with me this morning and I've said this before in my classes, but the truth is that me telling you all of this, me giving you all of these handouts, no color. <laughs> me showing you all these demos is nice and fun and wonderful. But the truth, the most powerful thing I can teach you guys going forward, because Michael Orwick's not always going to be there with you, um, unless you just keep signing up, um, but <laughs> is asking the right questions. It's not the answers we're looking for. It's the power is in the questions. And the questions are generally, what do I see? I see green. Okay, what type of green? What way is it leaning? Is it light? Is it dark? Is it warm? Is it cool? Is it yellow? Is it red? Is it blue? And again, those aren't, we're just looking for the subtleties within there. And that's gonna help you so much as you're moving forward. Phew. Man, get off your soapbox, Orwick. Come on. Let's <laughs> Oh, keep pouring it out. I need to write all this down. All right. Yeah. When you do, would you send it to me? Sounds like great okay. stuff. I guess I can understand my handwriting when I go back. Okay. Go ahead and type it first. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any questions on that? And I promise that wasn't all just a cop out. So I didn't have to teach anymore for the rest of the day. <laughs> now you got to demo it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I got a couple ideas. The only question I have, Michael, is um, am I the only one that struggles with the Hansa? It seems like it's very it it's um the pigment concentration is uh light. Yeah. And yeah. and yeah. I did not buy CAD yet light because I decided I was gonna work my way away from it. That's what years and years and years ago I used was CAD, but um yeah. that Hansa, I just was no, and it, it's I've been finding that it grays down a lot. So getting a vibrant light yellow uh is really tough with a Hansa. Yeah, I am um lately, especially with that vineyard painting that I where is it over my shoulder back there? Yeah. When I was getting the top light on those trees, I just couldn't get them without the cadmium yellow. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm still learning about that. Um, I'm guessing that maybe I'll be able to use a, a combination. And the funny thing is, is I talked about how yellow takes up the least amount of color space on the color wheel. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding that I can get away with almost one red, just the quinacridone red, because it warms up and it cools down so nicely. And it's a pretty strong pigment. But with my yellows now, I feel like, man, I might be up to three or four mm -hmm. yellows in my palette. Uh -huh. yeah. Especially Me too. focus. Um, with blues, there's times where I don't bring out manganese blue and I can just use ultramarine blue or, um, yeah, there's, but uh, yeah, with the yellows, I'm finding I do need more mm -hmm. color sometimes, especially if I want a bright yellow. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the Hansa because of its transparency, but I like the cadmium because it literally can cover things and it can uh, affect those greens stronger. So Kristen, great question. You get the first gold star of the day. I use transparent yellow. That's um, that's a little cooler yellow, but it's very, very transparent like the Hansa yellow. Yeah. So when you're mixing, if you wanted to mix a verdant bright green with that, I bet you it's going to mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, so I, I I am learning about all that. I, I up until recently did use a cadmium yellow light or a cadmium lemon, oh, and um, because of the price of cadmium, because of the dangers of using cadmium paints, um, I was really trying to find a good enough um, replacement. And again, in my talking with the different paint manufacturers, specifically mostly Gamblin. Uh, Hansa Yellow was their best option as a backup. Mm -hmm. Right. It really has its, I mean, that's just it. All of these pigments have their bonuses and their weaknesses. So I, I understand when I, you know, meet painters that have 37 colors laid out and they can tell you, you know, mm -hmm. I use this purple because of this and I use this because of this. But the truth is, you know, if I'm painting vibrant greens and like those vibrant greens that I'm talking about, are only the very tops of those vineyards. Only mm -hmm. the, I just couldn't get it to do what I wanted it to do. And a touch of cadmium yellow, boom, it was fixed. So, Have you tried mixing a transparent yellow with white? Um, just a touch of white to make it more opaque and have that, does it pop as well? Well, the uh, up until recently, the only true transparent yellow I had was Indian yellow. <laughs> So mm -hmm. then it kind of leans towards yellow or towards orange, orange a little bit. But I do have a tube of transparent yellow. Um, I don't even know if it's been opened yet. Um, so I will be, it was recommended to me. Um, so I will be curious about that. Um, but yeah, th but the problem is what happens when we add white yale? Yeah, it's it's a cool color. Um, and if you want a warm yellow, it knocks it out. That's why I was wondering if you tried yeah. that. So the, yeah, we can add white because white is a an opaque color, but white, I personally like to think of white as a color unto itself, not just mm -hmm. a value. And it, I think of it as a cool. Yeah. So it's like cool. if you're trying to make a bright, bright pink and you're just like, man, I keep adding white to this red and it just becomes this cool, cold pink. It's yeah. because it's cold. Right. But if you, I was just curious because if you added a little bit of Indian yellow and a little Hansa and then mix it with white, if that wouldn't, I mean, I haven't tried it. I'm just thinking out loud to make it more opaque and get the brightness you want. I don't uh, know. Maybe maybe in addition to greens, mixing yellow is something to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's try that today. Thanks. Remind me, Gail, please. And Cheryl, I see you've got a question. Yes. I, have, I have a new a new yellow, but I don't know if it comes in oil. So I just, I have it in acrylic, but it's called <laughs> B-E-N-Z-I-M-I-D-A-Z-O-L-O-N-E. -I, -E. I mean, it's a long thing. It's very light. We're going to name our daughter. It's PY-175. So you might be in oils and see if it makes a difference. Can you hold it up? How, how do you say that word? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I start with the B-E-N-Z and then I kind of. Yeah, that's a true transparent yellow. Oh, oh. 
Am I holding it still on her? Yeah. Wow. Is that an Italian word? Like I have no idea. Is yeah, it, just grab my tube of transparent yellow. I'm just gonna see what the code is if I can see it. Yeah, and transparent yellow is um a cooler yellow than the um Hansi yellow. Yeah, and I have a transparent yellow medium. Yeah, that's what mine is. That's cool. Is that, is that Rembrandt brand? Yes. And I like Rembrandt's burnt umber also. It's yeah, it's, they're burnt umber. I think that may be one of my favorite tubes of paint in the world right now is the transparent burnt umber. Transparent umber? Or they're just burnt umber, both. Burnt umber. It's not uh, stiff like uh, gambling. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I like it. Rembrandt. I'm maybe switching more and more and more towards Rembrandt. Well, the reason is, is that the tube of gotcha. and it's beautiful and buttery, and that's their selling point. But that just means that some colors may have, you know, more mixing or more things in it to make it that. But I'm sure finding it a great resource, having all my tubes of paint, you know, not having a yellow that's really hard and a is your mic phone on michael what's the question you're breaking up i am i think somebody else's mic is open i think so yeah uh, also and, I, and i'm not sure you've got it locked on you either uh not yet no i was just having a yeah, anybody. i i noticed that uh there might be a gain suppressor on your microphone michael so that when someone else speaks it crushes your mic temporarily. So it's another reason why we should all keep our mics muted until we need to say something. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. Could I also ask a question just because it cut out? Um, so you like the transparent umber or transparent burnt umber? Oh, I love both of them. Work. But I, okay. um, the transparent umber is just fantastic. And that I, I apologize for saying the transparent. Um, I don't even have any of the transparent right now um but it is uh just a fantastic color and like linda said that most burnt umbers come out very firm because it's a earthy you know it's an earth pigment and uh so it can come out really kind of hard and uh hard to use um so i really oh, like yeah, it it's real. it's nice and quickly because that's one of the reasons i love burnt umber colors for about three minutes. all right i'm not Seeing where the no background noise is coming from. Michael? Yeah. I have a question that I have forgotten to ask you several times. Fine, now. It, it, um, Fine. It, another paint question. Um, I noticed on an old video of yours online that uh, you had a number of Gamblin's uh, 1890 or 1980 um, paints. Do you have any problem with those? Uh, you just use a little more. Um, I actually was using those kind of specifically because some colors like the cadmium colors are can be too strong. So like a cadmium red under that is much cheaper. And oh, yeah, way. Way cheaper and more controllable for me. Um, I One of my favorite colors right now is the Payne's Gray from them. The oh, really? Because it's not so strong and it's got this really kind of beautiful bluish. I actually have a tube of it out to mix some greens with. Um, so you have to experiment. So I personally don't need that vibrant. I, don't, I just don't paint vibrant, vibrant pictures that often. So I don't need that super high chroma pigment load. Um, and a lot of times I'm literally just trying to neutralize colors, again, using the split primary palette. Um, and if you want to paint a little more impressionistically, let's say a little more brushwork, a little more um, density to your paint, it's actually really great because the colors are gorgeous when you put out a good luscious amount of them. Um, my good buddy, Anton Pavlenko, who you, I think a couple of you guys mm -hmm. know. Yeah, I've met him. Yeah, uh, he paints with a lot of 1980s and a lot of cheaper paints, but because he's putting on so dang much paint, that the pigment load shows up and he's got the density that he wants. He's got that uh, a lot of paint. So, um, you know, most instructors are going to tell you, you get what you pay for. Don't buy cheap paints. 
But the truth is, if you can find good cheap paints that are doing what you want, fantastic. Um, so I'm I'm always experimenting, um, but that also means I have drawers full of tubes that I'm less than happy with. Um, so I like it for especially the cadmium colors because they're so darn expensive and I don't need that super density generally. Um, but, uh, and they're, you know, Winton is kind of the, um, the cheapest of the student grade paints, I believe. And, um, I, I have a really hard time with those colors when I walk around to students, you know, and they just bought the cheapest paints possible. There's times where I'm like, yeah, I can't make the color I want to make or that you want me to make on your palette because these colors aren't capable. They can't brighten up that much. They can't. Um, so and what, I, which one was that? I think Winton is one of the worst. And I hate, you know, Winton, if you're out there and you want to sponsor me, let me know. Um, but if, uh, you know, um, but I've had probably the most struggle. Like there's times where I'm literally like, are these Winton paints that I'm using right now? Because they'll be like, I just can't make this, you know, bright green. I can't make this orange or whatever. And, you know, you don't see the tubes because it's all squeezed out. There's times where I'm just like, I think these are Winton paints. And yes, indeed they are. Um, so yeah, it, it is trial and experimentation. I like Gamblin because they have a very strong pigment load. I like, um, um, I'm really enjoying Rembrandt right now. Um, I've got a whole bunch of different tubes. I even bought a bunch from China recently, um, that were really cheap. And I don't like some of them and some of the other ones I'm really liking, but I can't even read what the ingredients are. It's all literally in Chinese. Um, so uh, I don't know for sure. You know, I'm not, I can't even tell you if I might have lead in it. <laughs> um, so you can almost I, count on it. <laughs> yeah. So I probably won't be buying more of those, um, but I, I thought I would experiment. Um, so yeah, I, I, there are some colors in the 1920s that I like more. Um, and some that I don't like. And then especially when I'm leaning towards my more transparent work, the 1920s work great. Really nice. Okay. Working with my more subdued earthy colors, the 1920s work great. Um, okay. There's a lot of Cobra. Cobra is a high pigment load. That's a Rembrandt uh, adjacent brand. 1920s or? 1980. 1980. 1980. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Great. I will. Uh, well, I have to order everything here because because there's no art store close by. So I it doesn't hurt to buy. You know, if you got a couple dollars extra to just you know grab the tube that you would get and grab a 1980s tube as well because again it's one third the price oftentimes. Um, and just and make testing and see. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Blick is having a online is having a great sale right now. So I thought maybe I'd go ahead and order the 1980s from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found that the um, I've I've had okay success with titanium white because that's again the tube, of course, the color that I go through the most of. Um, I've had okay success with the 1980, but if I need really good coverage, then it doesn't. Then I'll pull out the regular titanium white. But a lot of times I'm just using a little bit of white to, you know, soften a color, to subdue a color, to slightly lighten a color. So that works. But I haven't done any like true side by side, you know, making color wheels, making graphs. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm not an expert. Uh, feel free to call Gamblin too. They're wonderful about talking to people and explaining it. But yeah, it basically the whole premise is that it has less pigment in it. That's what makes it cheaper. Um, and then with less pigment means more filler. And you hope that it means oil um, and a good quality oil and not like a, some kind of a weird transparent filler that makes the paints feel weird and do weird things. So great. any other questions, guys, before we move on? I will just say that I ordered a two oil titanium white off of eBay or not eBay, Amazon. They are called um, Art Supply. Don't bother. They're terrible. They're all, and you'll just hit yourself for getting them 
they have gone in the breach to our oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Sometimes by ordering, you get what you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That makes sense what I said. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it is better to generally buy as you know good a quality as you can, um, but there are yeah. some good, reasonably priced brands out there. Paints are getting better and better and better across the board for the most part. Um, and new brands are popping up all the time. I'm a little hesitant personally, but all of a sudden, you know, I'll have a friend of mine who's like, oh, I've moved completely over to blah, 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 you know, colors because they're so great. So I don't know. I'm just not as, I'm not an early adapter when it comes to a lot of things. I'm not so experimental that I'm willing to, you know, buy a whole bunch of colors from one new brand, but, um, yeah, and you can read online. You know, if you have questions, just do a quick Google search, you know, reviews of, and um, what is it called? Wet Palette? Is that the name of the website? Mm -hmm. Where everybody just shares everything. Um, a lot of times when I get questions from you guys that I don't know the answers to after class, I'll go to Wet Palette and you can type it in. And, well, you could spend hours reading all the reviews and all the different things that, they go into depth, but luckily it's generally broken down so that you can find what you're looking for. I believe Wet Palette's the right name. Anyways, all right, great. And Don, how are you doing? Very quiet over there in your corner. Uh, am I supposed to speak? <laughs> if you'd like to, I just want to check in on everybody and make sure everybody's comfortable with the, the direction the class has taken this semester. And no, I, I like I like where you're going, Michael. I like the exercises. I don't say a lot because if I listen long enough, my questions always get answered. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, you know, you are the only other guy in here, so speak up every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, here's my next question. Then, is you guys. Very, very busy. Would you like to do start with the demos or start with uh, looking at your guys's work? And yeah, with oh, so I want to do a green color wheel, and I want to um, possibly just put a little quick uh, painting together. It'll probably be very impressionistic, but just showing the different greens in that little photo I uh, sent to you guys today. Green color wheel. All right. Yeah, color wheel. Take a five minute break and I'll get my palette and easel set up and uh, we'll do that and we'll see how much time we have left over for uh, giving feedback. But anyways, so proud of you guys. The homework looks fantastic and I'm so glad you guys are all learning uh, what I hoped you'd learn. So perfect. See you guys in five. <laughs>